Matthew chapter 6, talking today about give us, forgive us, give us, forgive us. In the study of the uh, what's known sometimes as the Lord's Prayer, the, the model prayer, the type of prayer, when they asked Jesus, teach us to pray, this is what he gave them. After this manner, he said, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In verse 11 there, he says, Give us this day our daily bread. Matthew 6 and verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Over in Luke, it's rendered... Give us day by day our daily bread. So Matthew has the uh, the connotation of asking for it every day, and Luke has a connotation of asking for it today as a as a perpetual giving. And I believe the Lord does both for us. He gives as we ask. He also gives endlessly provision for His people. Give us this day provision. Give us needs. Give us sustenance. And this day is what we ask for, and what we ask for is bread. Give us this day our daily bread is, is the prayer that's being made in the model prayer. Now, you can go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'm going to read John chapter 6 where he says, I am the bread of life, Jesus is talking, which came down from heaven, and giveth life unto the world. So here Jesus makes the clear statement that when we ask for daily bread, yes, it's sustenance, yes, it's meat, yes, it's the food that provides for you, but it's also asking for a daily dose, day by day, receiving of him the bread of life. Jesus as the word, Jesus as himself, he is the ultimate provision of life, especially unto the believers. He's the giver of life. He is the life, the Bible records. Here is in the model prayer where we actually ask for our specific needs to be met. So like I said, when you're going through this type of um, prayer after this manner as Jesus is teaching, you ought to be thinking of the verses that he's saying and then thinking of how you can make that into part of your prayer. Our Father art in heaven, obviously giving him the praise and, and for his holy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Always focusing on the will of God being first and foremost accomplished in our lives and in the whole world. Um, you say, give us this day our daily bread. That's asking for provision, asking for from him what he has to offer for us. Now, we need to keep in mind the idea of contentment and contentment as a virtue when we're asking for things in particular. So in Psalm chapter 37, verse 25, he says, I have been young and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. So here we understand from the psalmist uh, prayer from his writing that there are certain needs which are basically guaranteed for the Christian. They're not going to be begging bread. They're not going to be forsaken of their God. They're not going to be left out high and dry. God's always going to come through, sometimes just in the nick of time. We would, you know, say you're in a situation where you just have nothing to eat. You have no food. You're about to starve to death. We would like for God to, weeks before that, already be providing a stockpile before us. But the reality is, is that God promises to provide things like bread for us without us having to go out and beg for it. In other words, God has always has things in line so that his people will have the necessary shelter. His people will have the necessary sustenance that they need. Now, some of us go without for a time, and there could be a time in your life where, where things are tight and where you're, where you're really struggling to make ends meet. But that doesn't mean that God's forsaken you just because you're going through a tough time, just because you're without at a, for a moment. That doesn't mean God's forsaken you. It simply could be that he's just trying you, just, just giving you, trying to get you to the end of your rope so that you can eventually realize when he provides for you that he gets all the glory for it because he came through just when you needed him most, just in the nick of time. Here, that psalmist cries out and he says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. And we're righteous in Christ. And we're not, we're, we won't be forsaken because of that position that we have. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19, the Bible says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And I had you go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 
And notice that when, when he says God shall supply, he says it's all your need according to his riches that are in Christ Jesus. So it's not all your want, it's not all your desire that God's promising to supply, but what you need, what you, what you absolutely bare necessities need to get by in this life, God shall provide according to his riches in Christ Jesus. And I love that the Bible says that, that word very clearly, according to his riches. It's not out of his riches. It's not like God has a limited supply and he's going to provide for us out of it portions of it and then it's dwindling kind of as he gives it out no he provides according to his riches there, there's abundance of upon abundance upon abundance and infinite supply that God has available for his saints and he provides for us according to that abundance that he has that innumerable abundance there in first Timothy chapter 6 look with me in verse 6 it says but godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. So the Apostle Paul is teaching Timothy uh, contentment. Now him as, as, a, as a servant of God, as a servant over a church, he had to learn to deal with being content. Godliness is the primary. Coupled with contentment, that is great gain. For us, though, quite often in this life, we think gain is godliness, but that's not, that's not the truth. The Bible says gain is never godliness. Just because something is growing and flourishing, that doesn't necessarily mean it's doing so by, by godly means. The, the rich people, just because they're getting more riches, it doesn't mean that they're more godly. And then the same is true with the, the Christian that seems to be losing and falling short and kind of stumbling in this life and in this walk. If he remains godly and content, that's where his gain comes from. That's where our gain as believers come from, from being godly and being content with such things as he have. And the reality is this, we brought nothing into this world, it's certain we can carry nothing out. So everything that you have now is gain. You got clothes on your back, you've gained from when you were just born, correct? Everything uh, house-wise, um, car-wise, provision-wise is all gain compared to the nothing that you came into this world world with meaning God has only provided extra compared to what you came into this life with you have life God gives that to you you grow and you walk this world and you and you do the best you can but ultimately bottom line is God promises to provide the need God promises that his seed would not be forsaken nor begging bread and he promises those things and wants us to be content therewith you have food, you have clothing, you have sh that shelter to keep you warm. Be there with content. And yet this world is full of covetousness, isn't it? The guy out on the street that has food and has clothing, what is he desiring? He's always desiring more, whether it's his fix or whether it's the house that he wants or, or whatever, right? There's always these uh, these these scales and rel of relativity in this life. And you even look at the rich person that has everything could be imaginable. He's coveting after something more. He wants the bigger house, the bigger boat, the bigger car. He wants everything more, more, more. When really the best position for anyone to be in, whether we've been gained, being made of great gain or whether we seem to be suffering loss is that we should be content with what we have. Be godly and be content in having food and raiment therewith. Be in that position satisfied. Be content with such things as you have, knowing first and foremost who you have received them from. Now, that being said, contentment with food and raiment. Okay, good. If you're in that position, it still doesn't mean there's necessarily anything wrong with praying and asking for your wants, asking for some desires, asking for some helps, asking for some encouragement. You know, a little bit more than food or raiment. It's, it's hard for us to imagine being content with that, but you know what? There's so many people in this world that that's what they have to be content with because there's nothing else. We're so blessed here and we have so much more, and yet I don't think it's still a sin for us to, to pray for that old beat up car to be replaced by a new one. I don't think it's wrong for us to pray for God to help us pay some extra bills so that we can have the internet in our house or something like that. I don't think it's wrong for us to pray for God to to uh, to provide for our family, you know, not not just uh, you know rice and beans every day for but maybe maybe some meat in the house and some more sustenance. I don't think it's wrong for us to to, to want things and to have desires above and beyond our basic needs or to desire helps or encouragements along the way. There's nothing wrong with that. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. <clears throat> if you go to Matthew chapter 7, 
And beginning in verse 7, the Bible says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if his son ask bread, will ye give him a stone? Or if he ask fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Therefore, all men, whatsoever that ye would that men should do unto you, even so do unto them, for this is the law of the prophets. My point ended between 7 and 11 there. So God is making the, the parallel between myself and my child. If, the, if, if a child asks you who you love, who you've raised, who, who is, is begotten of you, if, if your child asks of you um, a bread, where you give him a stone, if a child asks for you... Um, a fish, would you give him a serpent? Would, would anyone be such as to kind of deceive and, and, and trick their, their, own, their own family like that, giving them something that is beneath or even yay worse, right? If you want a fish, maybe to eat it or, or, or whatever, you, you don't want to get a serpent. You're, you want bread for food and someone gives you a rock? That's no good. And that's not something that God would do to his. If ye then, being evil, the Bible is making that parallel, that I'm, I'm not a righteous person, I'm not holy, I'm not sanctified, I'm not, I'm not the best example as God would be. If ye then, being evil, still know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, your Holy Father, the one that in the model prayer you're reaching out to first and foremost, as you begin your prayer and meditation time, how much more shall he give good things to them that ask him? God is ready, willing, and able to give good things. And the parallel is plain. You're, you're not a good person, and you still give good gifts to people that ask of you. God is the best of all things, the greatest of all, the Father in heaven, and he gives according to that purpose as well. He gives good things as you ask for good things. So if I'm asking for something that is good, you know, maybe I'm asking for, for example, a vehicle that's not run down and I want a little bit bigger of a vehicle so I can get my family around and then also pick someone else up. That's a good thing. There's a good motive behind that. If I ask something like that, if I seek the Lord in that, if I knock on him and say, hey Lord, could I have this and, and, and ask him for the right things, for good things, how much more shall our Father give those things because it's out of the abundance of what he has. It's not out of, rather, it's according to the ones here. There's no, there's no lack in what God has, so the principle is there. And we heard that in James, or we've heard that before. You have not because you ask not. So come to God with your petitions. He might say no to certain things. Maybe you're asking for something that is not a good thing. In other words, it wouldn't be beneficial to your life. It wouldn't help you. It would be more harm to you. There's still no harm in asking. There's no sin in asking God for certain things and desiring certain things. If you do it with the right heart and you just simply want to be blessed by the Lord, he will give good things to those that ask him. A uh, story about provision, if you could, go to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. <clears throat> 1 Kings chapter 17, and in verse 8 we'll begin reading. 1 Kings chapter 17, and verse 8. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephtha, uh, Zarephath, or sorry, Get thee to Zarephath, which belong unto Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman to sustain thee there. So here's Elijah, and he gets a command from God to go and to spend time here and be sustained by a woman, okay? This was after he had left the brook where he was just simply waiting there for a, for a bird to come and to provide for him meat all the time. And then to fly over this brook as the water began to dry up and he started to sort of worry about there being enough water and started to wonder, you know, if a raven's bringing you your food, you're going to start to kind of doubt and think and, and, and wonder if this thing's even going to show up. So maybe going to the woman and being sustained by that would have been a better idea for him. But either way, he goes. In the verse 10, it says, So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the, wo the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may 
drink, okay? He had been getting it from a brook that had dried up. And so now he says, and as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. So he saw that it was clear that the woman had the water available. And then he also asks of her this bread. And she said, in verse 12, as the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat and die. So this is a bleak scenario. He says, okay, I'm going to get my water, right? This is good. But then as he asks her, hey, bring me also cake, her response is, I, I've got nothing. We're going to prepare this little meal and this little oil on these two little sticks. And we're going to make just enough food to satisfy our stomach for this moment. And then we're going to die because there is nothing left after that. And so Elijah is now probably thinking to himself, you know, wow, what a scenario. This, you know, we might complain in this scenario. We, we got food, we got raiment, just enough, right? But, but it, it doesn't seem like there's a long sight in this. There's no, there's no promise of tomorrow except for them. It's just to die. But there in verse 13, and Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make it for thee and for thy son. And so that's a strange thing to ask a woman that's got just enough food to get through the day, and then she plans on dying. He says, make for me first. For, here's the, here's the statement of faith here. For thus saith the Lord, God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did, according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. So here's our example of a man that made that statement to a woman that was ready to die. And a woman that responded in faith, both of them to the word of God, and did as was expected and as they intended, and then God came in and provided for exactly what he said. Thus saith the Lord, thus saith the word of God, until it rains, this food will not waste. Until it rains, this cruise of oil shall not fail, and the promises is made. And so we have the promises that we've already listed over, that that his seed won't make bread, that God shall supply all his need, that if you're just content and godly with such as ye have, that God takes care of the rest and provides. And here's an example in the scriptures of the word of God being spoken, and three people following what God said in faith, and God just coming right in behind them and providing exactly what he needs. He, they did eat many days. So there's your day by day. There's your, give me this day my daily bread. Give me the provision now, Elijah said to the woman. Give me meal to eat and meat to eat now. And they all partook of it with no promise of tomorrow. But day by day by day by day, yea, many days, God provided for the need that they had. And how much more does he provide for us? The next, if you were to go back to uh, Matthew chapter 6, he says, Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive us our debtors. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Over in Luke, it's, it reads, forgive us our sins. Debts and sins kind of used interchangeably there. Now, he says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, in the, in the debt-driven society that we have, we can easily ask for God to forgive us for the debts that we've accumulated in our lives. I mean, the problem with the way things are run right now is almost as soon as an adult is ready to kick off their life, they're telling you that unless you go to a university, you're not going to get a job that's worth a lick. And so quite often people will go out and they'll pick at 17 years old what they want to do and they'll jump into this career immediately taking on at a substantial amount of debt. And that's how they start their lives. My advice, and you're free to make your own decision, would be actually to just get a trade and get into work. So learn from somebody in that. I mean, that's probably the best thing that you can do in this day and age. I did both. I went to university. I spent a lot of money and then dropped out to go to college to take the same thing. But college had a more practical thing. So either go to community college or go to uh, a trade and just learn how to work with your hands in any kind of field that will always have a provision. Like, think about this. 
plumbing. There's always going to be a toilet that's plugged. There's always going to be a sink that's leaking, right? Some things like that. Uh, building things with your hands is a, is a great way to get into things. But even myself, I went to something a little bit more working with my mind. But in, in hindsight, university disaster, college, a little bit better because it was more practical and hands-on and actually got me into the workplace faster. But I could honestly, where I'm standing now, look at my career path, and I probably could have done the same thing just by the one most important thing, and that's hard work and just showing up on time. That's you right. work hard, you show up on time, you're always there, and the boss says, I need somebody to stay an extra hour, be that guy that does it. Young folks, that will go way further than paying a fortune for a university education, okay? Yeah. Hard work, dedication, serving your boss is the best thing that you can do, honestly, in this life to get ahead. So we can easily go to God and say, Lord, forgive me my student debt. I was dumb. I was a bonehead. I didn't mean to, to accumulate all that. Forgive me my debts. Forgive me my debts. What about my credit card? I came into a hard time. What about my car payments? Man, my old one busted down. I needed to get this thing. Our mortgage. Lord, forgive me my debts. Okay. But the second part of that verse says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So Forgive our debtors? What do you mean? They're, they're crooks. They're the scum of the universe. These are the worst kind of people that would take your money on usury or give you money and have you pay it back with usury on top of that. But the reality is, is that the Bible does, and God and Jesus does call for us to forgive, be forgiven, ask for forgiveness of our debts as we forgive our debtors. See, the thing about our debtors is they're not all just wicked scum of the universe, horrible people. <laughs> Um, the big banks, sure, and all of the, the over-the-top kind of uh, echelon of society that's running the things. Of course, the Bilderbergers and all that kind of big government sort of things. They're scum. They're bad news. But average Joe uh, that's giving you a car loan, average small bank, whatever it is, they're in reality caught in the same mess that we are. We're in a debt-driven society. So forgive me my debts, Lord, as I forgive others. Because people are working the same system that we're working. We're all stuck under this world power system. And unfortunately, it's driven by debt. You can't get a car without going to debt. It's very difficult. You can't get a house without going to debt. You can't even rent a hotel room for a couple days without going into debt, without swiping that card and having the debt to back it up. This is how the society works. And our debtors are stuck in this same awful system. And so that's the kind of heart that you have to have when you say, Lord, forgive me my debts as I'm forgiving my debtors and those that have put me in this position. Ultimately, I put myself in this position by the circumstances, but somebody offered me the cash now to pay later with a little bit on top. Forgive them as well. Verse 14, it says, For, if you look, for if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So there's the principle there. If you forgive not, you won't be forgiven. If you forgive, you will be forgiven. It's reaping what you sow in this world. So forgive the debtors and you will have a better chance of being forgiven of your debt. It's promised here. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will, 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 will forgive you. That's the promise that God's making. If you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. You shouldn't be surprised when you're not. Go to Matthew chapter 18, and we'll see an example of this. Matthew chapter 18. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 18, and in verse 21 it says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Jesus is making the statement you need to forgive a lot. <laughs> you need to forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive. Peter wanted to put this cap on it, okay? How many times can I forgive my brother until I can just write him off? Is it seven? Does that seem reasonable? I, I think he almost went high with that. Maybe he felt like he was a little more sanctimonious and holy before God. And he's like, seven? I mean, that's a lot of times to forgive my brother that's repeatedly trespassing. Can you imagine just somebody like, you know, you're, you're walking through somewhere. You know when people kick the back of your heels? They're like, you know, you're walking behind them, kind of behind them, like, they kick you? They're like, oh, sorry. Kick you? Sorry. Oh, sorry. sorry. By the time you got to like five or six, you'd be like, what in the world? <laughs> 
how often do I have to forgive this guy? Till seven? I mean, that's reasonable, right, Lord? And he, no, he says, no, 70 times seven. 490 times. A guy can kick you in the back of the heels. You just keep on forgiving him. It's just, a, it's just a statement that he's making. Hey, you thought it was this much? No, it's way more. Just forgive, 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 forgive. Forgive a lot. Do you know why you ought to forgive it a lot? Because you need a lot of forgiveness. That's right. <laughs> forgive a lot. Just forgive and forgive. And forgive as much as you can because each one of us need a lot of forgiveness in our lives as we walk these lives. Verse 23 says, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which, which, sorry, like under a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had in payment be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but he went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told it unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had compassion on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. You see how God forgave, in the picture, the great king forgave an abundant debt. A humongous debt. We can take that as Luke had rendered it. Bunch of sins you were forgiven of. Many sins you were forgiven of. And then when he finally, after you beg the Lord, after you fall on your knees and say, God, wipe away my past and all the errors that I did. Of course, he forgives you in heaven. But here's the picture is that you've made a mess of your life to date. And now you're suffering all these consequences as a result. And God's ready. The Lord here is ready to take all from you. And yet, as soon as he is besought, forgive me, the Lord forgives him all. Cleans up his life, cleans up his debt, wipes it clean. Then he goes to his brother, and his brother trespasses in him in a very little way, a few hundred pence. And then the servant proceeds to beat him, and to mock him, and to put him in prison, and to just treat him sore. And the statement is made that if you forgive not every brother that you have their trespasses, as minor or as major as they are, then you will be, as God says, delivered to the tormentors. You will be paying back every debt that you have. God here is saying that we need to have a forgiving heart, one that is constantly and consistently forgiving, because the reality is, is that we all have that 10,000 pen or that 10,000 talent debt before a holy God. We need forgiveness, so we need to be one that is often and always for asking for forgiveness, but then being somebody that forgives others, as your Heavenly Father gave you example. Go with me for an example to 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. <clears throat> And in 2 Kings chapter 4, now we're dealing with the uh, servant of Elijah. Here's Elisha. And he is in similar experience with a widow woman that was to provide for him. Or rather, a widow woman came to him, and here's his experience with her. 2 Kings chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, 
What hast thou in thy house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow the vessels abroad of thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. So this is an interesting thing, is that she is limited by what she has. Elisha says, okay, I'm going to try to figure out your financial situation here and how we can help you and get your, get your, your boys out of being bond servants. What do you have in your house? What can I do for you? What do you want? And she says, I have nothing save a pot of oil. I have just this little pot of oil. And he makes the statement, go borrow the vessels abroad out of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. Now this is, this is interesting because I'm not a financial wizard. I'm not, I don't have all these things figured out, right? The stock markets and how you gotta run these things. But I do know that tech, usually when you're indebted, the first thing that you don't think of is to go and borrow more. <laughs> and yet this is what God says through his prophet. He says, go borrow of your neighbors more. This is how we're going to provide for your financial debt that you owe. He says, borrow not a few. The first thing that you notice is that she must have been in good standing with her neighbors. She must have been one that, that had a good reputation. She hadn't already, you know, stretched things thin, asked everybody to borrow this and, and borrow that. She was in good standing with them. She fell on hard times because her husband died, and he di when he died, maybe the mortgage wasn't paid and his life insurance didn't cover it, or maybe, maybe the car payment wasn't made and, and that wasn't accounted for. But he passed away, and she was able to go and borrow of her neighbors. So she had good standing with them, even though she was in such a severe debt. Continue on in verse 4, and it says, And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shall pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God and said, And he said, Go, sell the oil and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. So it took an immense amount of faith, a woman that had complete lack, to go and to ask for vessels that were empty. You would think perhaps... Um, it would have been better to go and ask for vessels that people had put some spare change in or something. But no, go and ask for these empty vessels. Ask for something that God can fill. Ask, show God a vacancy, a void, a need. Go to him in prayer and say, God, I have a vessel and I need it full. Is essentially what's happening here. She goes and she collects it, and at the word of the Lord through the prophet, they begin to pour, and the, it just keeps pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring. And all these vessels become full. That provision is made. And not only was her debt paid, but they had to live of the rest. They had more left over. They had the rest to live by, the rest of their time, or for a time anyways. Borrow not a few. So how many she borrowed shows how much faith is she had. How many problems and, and holes and vacancies and issues that she had. She brought them to God and he filled them with the oil. He gave the provision. And I think there's a key thing that we need to understand there. Is first of all, she was in good standing with her neighbors. And so she was able to go and borrow. She brought of her need unto God. And we need to remember that we have not because we ask not. We need to bring our needs unto God and show him. Lay them out before them. You got a big bill you can't pay? Show God. Lay it out before him. Say, look at how much this is, Lord. Pay this bill, please. Show him the need. Allow him to fill it. And the Bible records that the oil stayed at one point when they were pouring and pouring and pouring. Eventually, it just stayed. It stopped. Why? Because all of her problems were full. All of her vacancies were full. All of the voids in her life were full. God had provided. And if she would have brought more unto him, I wonder if she was wondering about that afterwards. Maybe I should have got more vessels. Maybe I should have brought more unto God. Brought more problems. Cast more cares upon him because he cares for you. And ultimately, in the end, this couldn't be a pro this couldn't be Credit couldn't be given to the man of God. Credit couldn't be given to the boys because they just brought their problems. 
Credit couldn't be given to the woman that simply just poured out. Credit couldn't be given to anyone but God in this scenario. And this is why God loves these situations. And we need to be weary of this because sometimes we get to the point where we complain, where we feel like all I have left is this little meal and some oil. Or all I have left is this small pot of oil. We get to that point and that's when we really start to complain. When that's at the point when God is ready to Take of your problems and just wipe them away. Take of your empty vessels and just fill them with oil. That's the time when God gets the most glory, and that's the time when God likes to do the greatest miracles before us. So as a final statement, we saw ask provision. You know, give us this day our daily bread. We saw we're seeking forgiveness in our prayer outline. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us. Give us. Forgive us. And it's interesting that, that that's the kind of order of things. First, he says, give us this day our daily bread. Then he says, forgive us. We have this mentality, and uh, Pastor McMurtry was talking about this, where we can't come to God until we're squeaky clean. We, we don't believe in repent of your sins for salvation. Now, we can come to God with, with dirt and sin and disgustingness on us, and he'll forgive us then. But we believe in repent of your sins for prayer. We believe that we have to make sure that we ask for all of the forgiveness, get everything clean before we can step in the presence of a holy God. But even Jesus in his model prayer says, ask first for provision, then ask for forgiveness. It's not a repent of your sins prayer life. We don't have to turn from all of our wicked ways to be heard from God. God just wants to hear from us. Just as just as when when uh, just as when the, uh, the the wayfaring son had sold all of his father's wealth and then he went and he lived with the swine and did all of that the prodigal son he returned to his dad his dad didn't say hey get a shower put on a robe and and wash yourself up and then i'll embrace you no the father charged to him his filthy pig stinking son embraced him and then said hey get that get him cleaned up get him help give him forgiveness this is what is it's happening when jesus says to us Ask for what you need to give us, Lord, and then ask for forgiveness. I will cleanse you and help you afterwards. So provision when it comes to God is that he always provides for us certain things. We're always going to have daily bread. We're always going to have clothes on our backs. Our needs are provided according to his riches in Christ. Then the, pro, uh, the principle is also there, though, that ye have not because ye ask not. That's more in the area of the extra needs. That's more in the area of, hey, I got into trouble with this. Hey, I, I need something. I, I, this would really help me. This would really encourage me. You have not because you ask not. And that's our biggest sin in our lives. And why we don't get our prayers answered is because we never <coughs> prayed them to begin with. So that's the area of provision. God will always provide, but with the extras, you have not because you ask not. With regard to forgiveness, there is that principle that ye have not because ye confess not. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we need to confess them. You also have that principle that we saw play out where you're forgiven not because you forgive not. So in the area of forgiveness, we need to confess our sins. We need to confess our debts. We need to show God our debts. Remember the woman that she showed empty vessels before God? She showed the problem. She showed the issue that she had. She confessed her debt before the Lord. And then he was the one that cleansed it, filled it up, and, and took care of that need. We need to confess our sins to find forgiveness for our sins. And then we also need to be one that is forgiving. Because if you're not forgiving, you will not be forgiven. And that's clear in the scriptures that we highlighted today. So that's just a little bit on the next step in our, our walk through the Lord's example prayer for us. Give us, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, is, is what we learned about today. And um, I've really enjoyed this so far. It's been a good teaching. I pray, God, that we would apply it. Heavenly Father.